morning, and thank you to the um, organizers for having me, and welcome to all of you to spend our Saturday mornings together. So I'll move right into the talk, and this is intended as a clinical talk about the approach to diagnosis and staging of MDS. So our objectives today are to review the recommendations for testing at the time of diagnosis and what our goals are with this testing and how this may be applicable to the individual patients that we care for. I'll review some recent changes from the pathologic perspective to the WHO classifications, and then I'll hope to provide you with a little bit of guidance for the current use of our molecular testing, which is a newer uh, modality that we're incorporating into the clinic. So just very basically, by way of background, MDS is a group of very heterogeneous clonal neoplasms, and I think it's this heterogeneity that can at some times be a challenge for all of us, both patients and clinicians, at the time of diagnosis. It is overall a rare disease, about five per 100,000, but it still is the most common myeloid neoplasm. And as we work to decrease the heterogeneity in this overall umbrella term of MDS, I think we'll be able to have some better control at the time of diagnosis for prognostication and therapy for our patients. This is just a graph showing the increased incidence per age from the recent SEER database, and it's certainly more common in males than females, and this is the population that we'll be seeing in our clinics. So in terms of the diagnostic evaluation, I know as clinicians you're very familiar with doing these things, but I often find it helpful to think about in the context of explaining to a patient at the bedside uh, why we're doing each of these testings and how it gets them to their goal of a diagnosis, putting them into a box for prognostication, and then moving forward with a therapeutic plan. So in terms of the diagnostic approach, this is taken from a paper by Luca Malcavetti that's actually from the European Leukemia Net and really represents a lot of the approach in Europe, but I think it's quite applicable in the United States as well. So at the time of diagnosis, it's really mandatory to look at a blood smear, a bone marrow aspirate, certainly the core biopsy, and to perform cytogenetic ab um, analyses. And these get into how we prognosticate for our patients. It's recommended and quite common in the United States to do uh, FISH, looking for detectable um, targeted chromosomal abnormalities, and then certainly flow cytometry and immunophenotyping would be recommended and strongly encouraged at the time of diagnosis as well. What are some things that are suggested, at least by this European Leukemia Group paper, are SNP array analysis, which is another way to detect chromosomal abnormalities, and then mutational analysis of candidate genes. And these are these acquired somatic mutations that we'll speak a little bit more about at the beginning. So this is a very reasonable approach at the time of diagnosis for your patients. And I do tend to talk through each of these with the patient as I'm performing the marrow. So certainly we'll start with morphology. And our colleagues in pathology are incre incredibly helpful at guiding us through this. But to be very honest, what is considered dysplasia is still in the eye of the beholder, in this case, the pathologist. And their definition is any 10% of cells in any of the lineages, so the white cells, the red cells, or the platelets, that look dysplastic under the microscope. And they actually don't make any distinctions between the different specific dysplastic morphologies. And one thing that is important to realize is that dysplasia itself is not specific for MDS. And it's not always reproducible among our pathology colleagues, and that's why some of these newer, um, more novel testing methods are hopefully helping us to um, again, decrease the heterogeneity in all of MDS. So I mentioned in that original sort of mandatory testing guidelines from the European Leukemia Net that chromosomal abnormalities are very important as part of the primary diagnosis for MDS. And this is just a pie chart showing the various karyotypic abnormalities that you may see at the time of diagnosis in MDS. And you can see that still about 40%, the largest portion of that pie, are patients that have normal testing. And these recurrent chromosomal abnormalities are all considered presumptive evidence of primary MDS. And I find this very helpful in explaining to the patients that the concept of an abnormal clone, um, I usually characterize it as a bad acting grandmother or grandfather, depending on the patient's gender, but um, that this is the inciting event for their MDS. But nonetheless, this still leaves a large number of patients that fall into the diagnostic category of MDS unclassifiable. They certainly have persistent cytopenias, they may have low blasts morphologically or by flow cytometry, and we don't have quite enough to make us feel good about how they're going to do because we're lacking some of the details at the time of diagnosis. 
In terms of what our pathology colleagues are thinking in trying to decrease this heterogeneity, you should realize that there's recently been um, a revision to the World Health Organization MDS terminology. And it's taken eight years to come to some consensus to be able to change this. And I, I leave this here not, um, certainly I don't have it memorized, and I would not expect anyone else to at the bedside. But it is helpful to realize that the categories are changing, and it's all with the goal of trying to have a better understanding of the biology and the differences of these different forms of MDS. There's a couple that are unchanged, which are certainly the deletion 5Q, which is a specific subset of MDS. And then the MDS unclassifiable is also unchanged, but they're trying to um, differentiate the other categories a little bit more closely here. So in terms of using these things that we've talked about to date, the morphology, the dysplasia, the blasts, and the karyotype, I know how familiar you all are with the IPSS, or the International Prognostic Scoring System. And this is a publication that we cite again and again from 1997. But it still is the most common tool for risk stratification. And certainly, I know you all have many patients that come in with their printout from the internet, as do I, um, saying I have a score of X, um, and what does that mean for me? And as we move forward, we are trying to refine the IPSS to have a little bit more granularity between the categories so we can predict how patients can do. Um, the newer version in the IPSSR, and I think many of us are trying to move to this because it again differentiates the categories a little bit better. It has a few more cytogenetic categories in terms of risk groups. Um, and it also has increased detail at the time of diagnosis and is intended to be more dynamic. So we're still incorporating cytogenetics and bone marrow blasts, but now there's a separation, whereas the IPSS just looks at the number of cytopenias, this looks more specifically at the hemoglobin, the platelets, and the neutrophils. And when the group uh, published this in 2012, in terms of differences from the 1997 publication, it did upstage patients um, who had previously been thought to be lower risk disease into the higher risk category, um, almost as high as 25% of these patients. And it was important to think about how that would have changed their therapies from the time of diagnosis going forward. So you can see that there is further distinction between the different categories compared to the survival curves I just showed you in the original IPSS. So how are we trying to refine this further? So I like to think of this as the molecular era in MDS, and I think um, we really are at a bit of a crossroads in this field in terms of how we're defining these diseases and some of the newer testing for our patients. So if you'll remember back to that pie chart that I showed you, there's still about 40% of myelodysplastic syndrome patients who have a normal karyotype, and it's this group of patients that we really need to have a better handle on how they're going to do. We certainly know, and I can see several experts in the room, that there's somatic gene mutations that are common in myelodysplastic syndrome. And I use this as one of the original references from one of the Boston groups, and it was published in 2011 in the New England Journal, where they use next generation sequencing looking at patients um, with myelodysplastic syndrome. And they found a large number of genes that had a number of mutations, the majority of which were loss of function. And I think it should be important to realize that more than half, just slightly over half of these patients had more than one mutation when they looked at their um, somatic genes. And this was about 50% of the patients that fell into that normal karyotypic group. And in this particular paper, they um, brought out five genes that were thought to have independent prognostic significance and overall predicted poor survival. And this was separate from the things that we've talked about to date that include morphology and cytogenetics. And this is where the field is going, again, trying to decrease that heterogeneity. I list the five genes here that, are content, um, that were from this publication. I know everyone's most familiar with the TP53. And there's been a number of further detailed analyses of larger number of patients um, trying to establish the spectrum and the frequency of these mutations. And I think as we're moving forward, we're understanding a little bit more about their clinical significance. This is just another representative publication that shows, based on who subcategory or morphologic subcategory pathologically, the frequency of these somatic mutations that we can see in myelodysplastic syndrome. And there's still uh, I think some uncertainties in the field here, but this is becoming more and more standard of care at the time of diagnostic procedures for these patients to check for these somatic mutations.
the ones that are most common are some of those which fell into the publication I just mentioned in terms of independent poor prognosis. There's also some others that we'll talk about in a moment. And you can see that um, based on this particular data that the combination of cytogenetics and this sequencing was able to distinguish some clonal hematopoiesis in these patients with higher sensitivity and specificity. So I like to think about the gene mutations in this colorful picture um, in terms of the different pathways. And again, it's getting to a better understanding of some of the biology once we realize what the somatic mutations are in our MDS patients. And the best part of this story, I would say right now, is that we have a lot of information in the splicing factor domains, specifically SF3B1, in terms of how this affects the biology of our patients, in this case, specifically with refractory anemia with ring sideroblasts. And eventually, this may translate into therapies in this arena. So something to remember, though, and I mentioned this in a diagnostic talk for MDS because it's important, that these mutations are found in people, a lot of people, as we age. This is from another publication from the Boston, one of the Boston groups showing exactly as we know with everything that as with age comes more of these mutations. And I think this is important and something that we need to be careful about in the MDS field in our patients that have cytopenias probably are going to have some evidence of clonal hematopoiesis and molecular mutations um, as they age, and we have to think about what we're going to do with this information. And this comes into what I call the acronyms everywhere category. It is possible that a patient will not meet full criteria at the time of diagnosis for true myelodysplastic syndrome by some of our traditional methods. And there's a great deal of literature coming out um, right now about what to do with and how to define these patients. And so I just mentioned three here. CHIP is called clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. And these are these somatic mutations, detectable clones, in the blood of healthy persons that may not have low blood counts. And I'll just mention, you know, in this particular graph that I showed you, these were actually mutations that were found in patients who had uh, psychiatric diagnoses or um, other medical comorbidities but not known hematologic malignancies. And so getting back to that, there's also the concept of ICUS, or idiopathic cytopenias of undetermined significance. And so these are patients that do have low blood counts, and they have one of these mutations found in their blood or in their bone marrow, but they wouldn't meet other criteria for myelodysplastic syndrome. And I think we have to be careful about how we monitor and follow these patients, and specifically that perhaps we don't use myelodysplastic syndrome therapies too soon in these patients that may not meet full criteria. And lastly, there's CECAS, or clonal cytopenias of undetermined significance. And again, these are the same sort of things. And we have to figure out what to do with these categories as we have further information in the somatic mutational field. So I've already shown you sort of a progression of how we've moved through the diagnostic pathway in myelodysplastic syndrome. And so probably one of the next questions you had in your own head is, well, should I be getting these mutations at the time of diagnosis, and what do I do with them in terms of prognosis for our patients? And I think this is the question that we all have, and we're sort of excited to think about adding something like genetic testing to the IPSSR. And this is a paper uh, from one of the groups in Cleveland that looked at the addition of somatic mutational testing to the IPSSR and seeing if it affected survival. And just how I showed you that when we went from the IPSS to the IPSSR, there was further differentiation of those survival curves. And you can see here, compared to the overall survival curves of just the IPSSR on your left and their cohort of patients at the Cleveland Clinic, there is further differentiation when you add the gene mutations. And this is where we're all trying to go for our patients, is to being able to put them into a category so that we're able to prognosticate in a way that's cleaning, clinically meaningful for them. So this is just another a little bit more basic science paper that I enjoy thinking about in terms of how these somatic mutations, based on what we know here today in 2016, um, are able to guide prognosis. And I mentioned in that very colorful picture a moment ago that the one that we know best is the SF3B1 mutations that are seen in refractory anemia with ring sideroblasts. We've always known that refractory anemia with ring sideroblasts lower risk MDS patients do do better than some other subcategories. But as we've now seen that um, a very large percentage of RARS patients do have the SF3B1 mutation, this certainly correlates with a better prognosis for these patients. And I'm hoping that over time, these bubble diagrams that I'm showing you 
we'll have the um, circles more spread out so we understand the biology of each individual type of MDS a little bit better. And certainly these are polyclonal processes and we'll have to really do a lot of good science to get to the point at the bedside where we can explain to patients in great detail um, the etiology of their disease, but it's certainly what we're working towards as a field. So where we are right now is using these molecular um, data to look retrospectively in some prospective studies to determine where we can predict that patients with or without certain mutations can predict response to the standard therapies that we have. And I think you guys may hear later on about those standard therapies from some of my colleagues. But based on what we know right now, these, um, the pattern of mutations based on retrospective looks at large cohorts of patients will have implication for prognosis and treatment. We've already talked about the SF3B1 story, which are more prevalent in lower risk disease, and this is associated with a favorable outcome that's been consistent across the literature. TET2 mutations and DNMT3A mutations may predict a positive response after either azacitidine or decitabine, these hypomethylating agents. This can be helpful in patients, though we do not use it to guide therapy at the time of diagnosis yet. Similar publications have shown that an absence of an ASXL1 mutation could also be a positive predictor um, with these same standard therapies. Certainly, I mentioned earlier that most people are familiar with the concept of P53 mutations not being good, and they have been shown to be associated with a lack of response to azacitidine and decitabine and a shorter overall survival. And certainly, some single mutations may worsen prognosis regardless of the IPSS, and that's what I showed you as we went through the survival curves for patients, and P53 is one of the better examples of this. We're also looking retrospectively and prospectively in the transplant literature, and you'll hear from my, one of my colleagues in a moment about transplant, and this has been looked at very similarly, that P53, DM. T3A and TET2 mutations when they're present prior to day zero and conditioning for hematopoietic stem cell transplant have been associated with a decreased overall survival, regardless of monosomal karyotype or some of the other poor prognostic markers at the time of transplant. And this is probably just another example of how minimal residual disease after therapy and before a transplant is not good for a patient. And we know, as with anything, the more mutations you have, the worse it is. So currently, I would say their predictive value is not fully sufficient to alter treatment decisions, but it is where we're headed as a field based on this data that I've shown you. So originally, I showed you a slide from the European Leukemia Net, and now this is a slide from the NCCN guidelines, which I think some of us may use more frequently here in the United States. And I just use this to show you that just incorporated um, in February of this year, we are to consider molecular testing for recurrently mutated MDS genes in appropriate clinical contexts. I didn't have the space to show you the footnote, but that's one of the reasons these appropriate clinical contexts that I mentioned to you, the concepts of CHIP, ICUS, and CCUS, as we're working through it with these patients. And we've always used genetic screening um, in patients with familial disease, but now we're realizing it has a greater role in acquired somatic conditions like MDS in patients who are a bit older. So I hope I've been able to show you today that MDS is a complex group of bone marrow malignancies. It's rare, but it's growing, which was that original picture from the SEER database. It can be challenging at diagnosis to deal with the different modalities we have for therapy. Marrow testing is critical, and we're hoping to work forward as we understand the disease prognosis and implications for therapy. We all start with the IPSS and the IPSSR for risk stratification and we're going to have um, additional incorporation of mutational profiling as we move forward. So I thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to take any questions.